Today is Father's Day, and uh, I think some of the fathers have had their breakfast given to them. Hey! Marcucci family are just stars. So uh, it's a day where we yeah, remember, look back or look forward or remember the day. But uh, I was thinking about Luke chapter 15 today and uh, the, the parable of the prodigal son, which could be the prodigal of the gracious father because he is such a uh, the representation Jesus gave us as a compassionate, extravagant, loving uh, father, very affectionate, and has a real heart for his son who is lost and who was dead and then was uh, made alive again. So we want to praise the gracious father, no matter what our own experience was of our own uh, earthly fathers, um, uh, we have a heavenly father that we can come to in the name of Jesus and uh, he is a God who loves us, He is merciful towards us, and He is faithful to us, cares for us, and uh, is a God who is in relationship with us. So, we're going to praise Him first and foremost today, so let's just uh, pray as we gather together. Father, we come before Your throne of grace in the precious name of Jesus, and uh, Lord, as we're gathered here, we pray just for a sense of Your presence with us. Lord, just that you would uh, move in our hearts and uh, enable us to engage with you through the praise and worship, and uh, Lord, the preaching of your word, the, the ministry of your spirit, and Lord, as we just Thank gather Jesus. together, be with us and encourage us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave. It's all by faith. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight Our fathers roam the earth With the power of His promise in their hearts Of a holy city built by God's own hand A place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophet saw a day When the long for Messiah would appear With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave by faith the church was called to go In the power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver captives and to preach good news In every corner of the earth we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Faith. 
if the mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his let's sing that again by faith the mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name we will stand we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him a soul's reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by we will stand we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and again we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight Oh, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, we know there's nothing impossible for you. Nothing impossible for you, Lord. Lord, even when we can't see it, we know you're working. Even when we can't feel it, we know you're working, oh God. Because you never stop working. You're the God who never sleeps, nor do you slumber. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper. That in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you are we maker. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are 
are here touching every heart, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, here in every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You're the way maker. You are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you're the way maker. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Oh, tell them this morning. That is who you are. 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 Oh, yes, that's who you are. That is 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 who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, and even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You know, verse 2, you are here. Healing every heart, hit touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you, and you are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turn it. Around, I worship you. I worship you. And you are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. That is who you are. 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 You are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, 
light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, yes. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Just the vocals. That is who you are. 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 One more time. That is who you are. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we do thank you that you are indeed the way maker, that you are the miracle working God, that you are the light in the darkness, that you are the one that uh, keeps your promises. And Father, we thank you that whatever situations we find ourselves in, Lord, that we can depend on a God who is faithful, a God who is trustworthy, a God who is the same yesterday, today, as he was uh, tomorrow, as he will be tomorrow. Lord, as your word says in Matthew 6 and 8, your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And Lord, we bring ourselves, we bring our petitions, we bring our needs before you, knowing that you already know us, Lord, because you know us better than we know ourselves. And God, we pray that you will meet those needs that we have. Lord, these may be needs within our family. They may be needs within our uh, work situation. It may be to do with uh, uh, those whether they're parents or whether they're children within our, our midst. Lord, we pray that you, uh, you would make a way where there appears to be no way. And God, that you will mend the fences, as it were, Lord, where there is brokenness and where there has been a division or uh, something has come in or words have been said that have uh, brought uh, uh, a degree of separation. God, we pray for your healing touch. We pray for the presence of your Spirit to, to move and to and bring reconciliation in these situations. And Father, over these last uh, week or two, we've been praying for the young pastor over in uh, Greenock, Elam, at uh, Hope Community Church, Paul Martin. And Lord, as the, the word progresses and the medical hope or the medical prognosis is, is not good, and he's now moved into a hospice, Father, we do pray for him and for his family that your healing hand will be upon him, even today, Lord God, that you would release that power that comes from heaven above, Amen. Lord, that would uh, bring deliverance from the, the cancer that has been, the cancers that have been afflicting his body. And Jesus, whatever the source of these things, we would want to stand against them in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We want to take authority over them, and we want to uh, command them to shrivel up and uh, die, Amen. and that they in would Jesus dissipate name. and disappear. Jesus and name. Father, we pray for him and for his family, for the church family, for the, the many, many people across not only the UK, but the world who are praying for Paul and for Isla and for the, the young family. And God, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done, and your grace would be seen, that your mercy would be evident, Lord God, your healing power would be demonstrated. And God, for others within our own uh, circle of influence, our own friendship within this church itself. We do continue to pray for Sandy. We pray, Lord, for your hand of grace to be upon her, to strengthen her, and Lord, to uh, enable her, and as we pray for Paul, to see the days on earth here lengthened, Lord God, for the plans and purposes that you have. And so, God, we submit the prayers that we have, and there may be other family members that we just lift up to you silently, or we, we bring them before your throne of grace, Lord, friends, and 
others, Lord, who are struggling with issues that, have, uh, uh, that seem difficult and uh, where there is no hope. And we pray, God, that you will bring your hope into this situation, that your glory would be demonstrated, that your grace would be seen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, we just pray that God will turn lives around and change situations. And for some reason, I've just got a memory of a time I was in Shetland. Oh, it must be nearly 20 years ago now, and we were in a ended up in a house meeting and praying for various people. And uh, there was a girl from Canada who was there, and uh, I remember just God impressed upon me, and He gave me a picture of uh, fences being broken down. And uh, I, I said, said to this girl, I don't know what this, but I think this is something that God is calling you to be involved in, and uh, rebuilding fences, uh, you know, spiritually rather than practically. But she then told me that she was part of a church that she just moved to. She really felt God had called her to this church, and it was called Mending Fences Church. So this was a, it was a great encouragement to me, to be honest. And I was just reminded of that as we were worshiping. And you know, this, part of what God's ministry of reconciliation is that it's to build fences to rebuild broken fences and things that I've allowed to get in and things that I've got out, we need to have boundaries and we need to have uh, uh, parameters and security uh, and things right in our own uh, hearts and lives. And I think it's just that sense that God gives us sometimes that ministry as well to connect with those who are broken, th things are broken down in their lives and gives us a word in season to help others who um, are, uh, you know, not at uh, all as it should be at this time. So some of the online stuff will stop this week and have a break over the summer. You know, one or two other meetings, maybe the midweek means may slow down as well over the summer to some extent. Lynn and I will have a holiday at some point. And uh, but we'll see how things go. Let's keep you informed on that in the next week or two. But for now, we are continuing with uh, Ephesians, and we are in Ephesians 2. And uh, such a wonderful uh, scripture, Ephesians 1 and 2. There's so much in there. And uh, the Apostle Paul has emphasized, among other things, to those who were reading the letter in the original uh, time, 2,000 years ago, the vital importance of knowing who we are in Christ, knowing our identity. It's got to be really carved into the very core of our being, uh, engraved into our hearts, and especially, as we saw last week, a society where the flesh, the world, and the demonic still mess with people's identities. And uh, in our current day and generation, there's a lot going on, particularly with young people and pressures that are being put upon them to be whoever they want to be. And that is creating a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, angst and anger and uh, um, intolerance and division within our society. And if we're looking to mend any fences, um, it's not hard to be involved in that in our day and generation. And as believers, however, we need to know who we are in Christ so that we can pray for and we can reach out to others with the message of the gospel, uh, with the need for salvation in Jesus to be proclaimed and the reality of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. He is to be known, and there is an exclusivity that He is the only way. Because outside of God, as we saw last week, outside of Christ, people are dead. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. And the truth is that only God has the power to make us alive together with Christ. And as believers, we're called to participate in God's plans and pray for people to become spiritually alive and to believe in Jesus. And that through the revelation of God's Word, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, people will come to a personal realization that they've been adopted into God's family as a child of God. Because that is the securest place for any of us to be in, to know that we are in that relationship. 
Because only in that relationship to God, our Creator, can people know who they truly are and walk in their true identity. You know, people are trying to find out who they are without relating to God in the matter. And that doesn't uh, lead to anything but uh, a degree of confusion. So we're going to read verses 4 to 7 of chapter 2. And these are uh, some of my most favorite verses in the whole of the Bible. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You know, there's only a few verses, but these are awesome words. In verse 6, we're told that God raised us up, even as He raised Christ. So how high did He raise you and me as believers in Christ? The answer is, as far as He raised Christ. For God the Father not only raised Christ from the dead and brought Him back to earth, after his sacrificial death on the cross, but he also lifted him up through space to the highest heaven and made him to sit at the right hand in the throne room of the universe in the heavenly realm. And he's done the same thing for you if you believe in Jesus Christ. Paul writes elsewhere in Romans 8, 16 to 17, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. When I was a young Christian, those at this blew my mind. How on earth could God take me after all I had done? Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. The Holy Spirit, in that verse, uh, we're told, bears witness to us that we are children of God. It means that spiritually, we are sitting in heaven right now. Amen. That is what God's Word tells us. It's quite incredible if you think about it. That God, through the power that raised Christ from the dead, through the power that exalted Jesus to the throne room of the universe, has brought us in a similar way from death to life. He's raised us up so that we too sit already in the heavenly places with Christ. You know, we are sat with Jesus in that position of unique authority at the Father's right hand. You know, in full view of the defeated satanic powers who Jesus made a spectacle of on the cross. You know, that is the place to be seated. It is the best seat to be seated. We've just recently changed the furniture in our lounge. I got an excellent deal from DFS in Glasgow for an ex-display suite. Woo, we just arrived at the right time. It had just gone on that day. And our previous settee was broken down, which Lynn tries to tell everybody is because of me. I think more of the fact that she was jumping on the settee herself, but I didn't actually see her do that. Anyway, it broke, so it meant that you were sinking down into it. It needed replacement, and the armchair that went with it was too big for the room that we currently have. When we were in Kirimuir, it was a good size to have, but it was just too big. And so the new cities are really comfortable to sit on. And because we're looking at this verse in uh, Ephesians 2, chapter, verse 6, of being seated in the heavenly places, I thought I'd look up some of the world's most expensive chairs on the internet yesterday. And we're going to have a look at these right now. The first one is there. This is the panda banquet chair. So if you like pandas and you have 80,000 pounds to spend, then this is the chair for you. There's only 25 of them in the world, and uh, it was made by a Brazilian manufacturer, Fernando and Humberto Campana. It's 100% steel, and the stuffed pandas are sewn directly onto it. They're not real pandas, by the way, just in case. I think that'll be allowed. And it gives the sensation of being wrapped around by fluffy toys. Now, there are some people probably in this room who don't mind that experience of having fluffy toys all around them, but you do need to spend 80000 in this case. Right, the next one. This is not quite such a comfortable looking uh, um, one. It's 
coming. That, whoa, that is the Lockheed Lounge Chair. This is by an Australian designer by the name of Mark Newton. It's made from riveted aluminium and fiberglass. It's got rubber feet as well, in case you're interested. And it gained international fame when the singer Madonna was seen reclining on it in a music video about 25 years ago. And then 2014, at Phillips Auction House in London, it sold. Sold for two million four hundred and thirty four and a thousand pounds more money than cents it's a record actually for a, a designer who's still alive for one piece i don't think it's particularly comfortable to sit on metal so the third one okay third one is called the D dragon's chair and it is designed by an irish uh, architect designer by the name of eileen gray uh, it was designed about 100 years ago and it's a wooden upholstered armchair. It features two stylized lacquered dragons. It was bought uh, 50 years ago by a Parisian art dealer for about uh, $3,000. And then it was bought by the French fashion designer Yves Saint Laurent, who you may have heard of. In 2009, it was sold at Christie's Auction House in Paris for almost 10 times the estimate. It was sold for 22 million euros which is about 18 or 19 million pounds for a chair. It was bought by the same dealer that sold it uh, some 40 years before then. You and I will never see, let alone sit on chairs like these, I would reckon. But we, when we contemplate the incredible truth of verse 6, that God has seated us with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places, then every other man-made seat falls far short of the promise that God has made to us. That, that promise that we are raised up and seated with His Son in the throne room of heaven. It's the best seat in the house. Indeed, it's the best seat in the universe. And no other seat compares to it. And it is a privilege. It is an undeserved honor for us to be in that place. We have done nothing to deserve it whatsoever. And when I talk about the best seat in the house, personally, I think about uh, times like when I was at the World Cup semi-final in 1982 in Barcelona in the Nou Camp Stadium, sitting on concrete uh, uh, benches up in the gods, looking down on Italy against Poland. 2-0 to Italy it was. But you could hardly make out the players. They were like little ants running around. But it was still a tremendous experience to be there, so high up, looking down. Or I think of sitting a few months ago in the passenger seat of a 60,000-pound Audi e-tron car that our son Roddy was taking to one of his firm's customers with its heated leather seats. Or I think, if I'm thinking of the best seat in the house, of the luxury reclining seats at the View Cinema. In Ocean Terminal or even in Livingston, I'm sure they've got them. I can't remember the film we went to see, but I remember the seat. You could fall asleep on it. Well, I think of the first class seat I sat on when I was on a train from Edinburgh to Manchester a few years ago and decided because the carriage was so full of noisy children. In Edinburgh, I thought, and then Tannoy announcement came, you can upgrade for 15 pounds to first class, and I thought, I'm out of here. And plus my knees were right up against the back of it, and I could, thought, no, this is not gonna be comfortable. So I went, paid my 15 pound, and it was just bliss. So much space between other passengers, and especially when you saw outside, people standing by this time, by the time we got to north of England. It was the best seat in the house, best seat on the train, and I've enjoyed them. Sometimes you have to pay a lot of money to get the best seat in the house. I don't know, some of you may be interested in tennis and Wimbledon is starting. And obviously, Queen's is on this week. And for a center court seat for the men's final day at Wimbledon, you can get at face value a seat guaranteed for £240. Um, but if you want to go a bit further, you get a hospitality package which gives you food and drink on top of the seat and you pay 700 to 1,650 pounds each plus VAT. Don't forget VAT. 
which takes it up to about £2,000. I think I'll just be watching the highlights on TV. And, of course, we couldn't go through the whole service without mentioning Friday night. What happened on Friday night, you say? Well, there was a certain game that took place at Wembley between England and Scotland, and some of the football fans paid over the odds. They paid several hundred pounds for tickets that were being put about by touts and uh, agencies. Was it worth it? Depends on your perspective, on what you think about money. But the best seat for most people was the one that they sat on in front of their TV screen, unless you were like Trevor, who wasn't supporting, uh, and it's probably calling for Gareth Southgate to be sat. Anyway, maybe he will be after this week. But even the best seat in Wembley or Wimbledon or the best seat anywhere on planet Earth falls far short of the best seat in the whole of the universe. The one that is described in Ephesians 2.6. The New Living Translation says, For he, traced, he raised us from the dead along with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms, because we're united with Christ Jesus. And that is the connection. Connected to Christ, we are sitting in heavenly realms. And that, yeah, your body is sitting on a blue chair for the most part couple of black chairs, but for a blue chair that cost a fraction of the dragon's chair that we saw earlier. It's a blue chair that costs a lot less than the best seat at any sporting or entertainment venue. But the fact is, it's only your body that is sitting on it. The you, the real you, the spirit soul part of you has been made alive to Christ. And that part of you is positionally in the heavenly realms right now. That is the place where you and I sit in Christ. We are in the throne room of heaven. We are in that place of authority, of power. That, that means we are already out of the dominion of Satan. But yes, our bodies are still here on earth. That's why he gets to us through the flesh, through the sinful nature, through our bodies, through our minds. But our spirit has been made alive together with Christ and is already in that place in Christ where one day when either we die or when we go to, uh, or when the Lord returns, and uh, when we will be completed with a new resurrection body, you know, that is where we are. That is our position. It's mind-boggling, and it should be, because it's incredible that he would take you and me as ordinary people, and what we have done, and the sins that we've committed, and who we have been, but that, is, that His mercy is towards us. He's made us alive. It's almost unbelievable. That's what the Word of God tells us, because our identity is in Christ, our position is in Christ. We've been raised up as a co-heir with Christ, and we're even now sitting in heavenly places with Him. And if you have any understanding of authority on the earth in terms of you know, military or police or whatever. You know, this is the, what God has raised us up to be. The source of heavenly power, all authority. We're there in Christ with Him. Not long after I was saved in 1985, when I was made alive in Christ, according to Ephesians 2, there was a new song written by Mark Veery and Paul Oakley, and Paul Oakley is better known, I would say, and he took the words of Ephesians 2 and he put them to music. It's a song that is now so old that you cannot even find it on the internet. There's no videos of it. I couldn't find any yesterday. But thankfully, it is in this edition of Songs of Fellowship. Remember when we used to have hymn books and uh, we weren't dependent on overheads or uh, projector screens? Uh, number, people would call out what number. You would have that up on the side. Number 635. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to sing it because, and you might remind it, I don't know if you ever sang this song. Anyway, I managed it the first time, mostly. You, O Lord, rich in mercy, because of your great love, you, O Lord, so loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, you made us alive together with Christ. 
and raised us up together with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places, and raised us up together with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. As I've said, yep. I think that was, went better than the first time. But the reality is Scripture in song. And 35 years ago, you know, you could read that, someone would preach on it, but we sang the Scripture, and it's there still with us 35 years on. It's a powerful song. In fact, the way that it should be sung is as men and women. It should be uh, kind of uh, round, or is it a round, or whatever you call it. But uh, it's a fantastic song. And Paul talks about who we are as Christians. He's making an exact parallel of what the Lord himself went through. You know, we died with Christ. We learn that in Romans 6. And now we're made alive together with him. We're joined to Christ. We have become identified with him. His life has become our life. Our new identity is Christ. He is our life. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And because we are in Christ, we belong to him. He has so welded himself to us that there is this unbreakable union that has been established. We are his and he is ours. And Jesus' own words in John's gospel, chapter 14, verse 20, declares to his followers, you and me and I and you. There is this interwoven meshing of us and him, and nothing can break that relationship. And so that means that when we are made alive, to, alive together with Christ, we are changed right to the very innermost core of our being. When we come to Jesus Christ, everything changes. We are different. We, our very foundation is different. We have uh, experienced the riches of God's mercy. We have experienced the great love that he has for us, and the amazing grace has saved it, saved us. And so everything changes. Our outlook changes. Our attitudes change. We take different approaches to situations. There is a, a change that takes place. And brothers and sisters can notice that in people's lives. Because if Christ is at work in us, if he has joined us to himself through the Holy Spirit, then there will be life and there will be changes. And we are raised up. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And the reason is that because of Hebrews 4.14, we have a great high priest who has already ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. It means that we are already accepted into heaven because we are connected. We are joined to Jesus. We are united to him. He has ascended to heaven, so we are joined to him. So it's like, say, Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, Andy Robertson, Scotland's captain, playing against Croatia. He scores the winning goal, kicks the ball in the net, heads the ball, whatever. The whole of Scotland wins the game. It's not just about Andy. Our captain is Jesus. He died and he rose again. We died and rose with him as a result. And once, since heaven is now our present dwelling, it must also be our future destination. So it gives us that assurance that if Christ is dwelling in the heavenly realm and we are already seated there, that we will be going to heaven our bodies will be going, oh, well, our bodies will decay, but we will have a new body. And heaven will not be a place where you'll just be a spectator. God will have things for us to do. One of the books I was referring to was this one by a guy called Richard Cokin, who is a pastor in London. And uh, he has got this commentary, Ephesians, for you. And he notes, this is one of the things, he compares it to a wedding, which the Bible also compares it to. Like places reserved at a wedding banquet in accordance with the groom's seating plan, seats are reserved for us by Jesus at his wedding feast. Since he has already sat down, it is as if we have sat down, because our places are secured in him. We shall soon take our seats to fulfill the destiny for which we were created. That is, to be united with Jesus 
to rule the new creation and the spiritual realm. So when we get a grasp of what it is to be seated in heavenly realms in Christ, it puts into perspective our troubles and our issues here on earth, however large or small they are. Because Paul is stressing that we need to be seeing things from that vantage point, from that position, rather from being just immersed in the world. We need to get out of our worldly mindset. We need to leave behind the arena where the prince of the power of the air rules and has his influence. We need to embrace a kingdom of God mindset that Satan is a defeated foe because of what Jesus has done on the cross and to rise above and put to death the desires of the flesh. For that is the character of the new life that God is working in in us and has been given to us by him through the richness of God's mercy, through the amazing grace that has saved us. And so if we look at mercy and grace, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. And we all deserve punishment for the sins that we've committed. We all deserve to die. We all, you know, you go, go on. But God, in His mercy, doesn't give us what we deserve. David Pawson, in his commentary, which is uh, this one here, says, If God only had justice, I haven't a chance. If God only had fairness, I haven't a chance. But God, being rich in mercy, loves to help the undeserving, and that includes all of us, you and me. We are recipients of God's mercy, of the richness of it. There is so much mercy in the heart of God towards people in this world. And He deals with the hearts and the brokenness of our lives. He is great in love. He deals with our guilt, our shame, and our need of forgiveness. He's dealt with it through Jesus going to the cross, shedding His blood, taking, covering our sins and our failings. He is the one who made us alive. He is the one who took us from death to life. Our God is abundantly merciful. That's mercy. Let's look at grace. Grace is giving us that which we do not deserve. None of us deserve salvation. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But it is by grace that you have been saved. And Paul refers to this more than once in Ephesians 2. And grace, as someone has said, is the most offensive thing in the Christian gospel. For it means nobody gets the cure to the killer disease of sin through anything that they do. It's all God's doing. And grace offends those especially who've tried to live good lives, who think that on the balance of their good deeds that they'll get into heaven. And we've been at funeral services where people who have not expressed any faith in Jesus Christ because they've done good works People have said they must be in heaven. But it's not a biblical understanding. Many people sadly believe they've done enough good to get there. But it's nothing to do with that. Scripture begs to differ. For if we did good deeds every day of our lives, it wouldn't get us a step nearer to heaven because grace is not God's response to anything that we do as if first I were to believe and then, God, you're going to make me alive. No, God makes me alive and then I believe. You know, you think of Lazarus in the tomb. He didn't decide to come out of the grave and then experience resurrection power. He experienced the power first and then he came out. Grace is unconditional, supernatural power from Almighty God that is released in order to save us primarily from our sin, and it is freely given. And the good deeds that we have done cannot help us to be cured of the killer disease that is sin, but it also means 
that nor can our bad deeds that we've done stop us receiving the cure to our hopeless condition. That is the good news of the gospel. That is why, you know, some people get upset when certain people come from uh, bad backgrounds. You know, you think of the Nuremberg trials, and you had Nazis who were uh, facing the death penalty, and some of them, even though they had committed atrocious things, came to faith in Jesus Christ, the grace of God, and some folk got really upset about that. They didn't deserve it. Well, nobody deserves it. Nobody deserves grace. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. It's all of God's grace. It's by grace that we've been saved. The dying thief on the cross stepped into glory. That is offensive to some. Why should someone who's a bad character go in, especially at the very last minute? especially if I am the one who's been trying to be good all my days. But the problem with that attitude is that pride is at the center. It raises its ugly head, and people start justifying their status. Well, I am better than such and such a person. I wouldn't do that sort of thing. People do it. But by grace means that salvation is God's free gift to us in Christ. It's all by Him. It's all His generosity. It is His will. It is purpose. There's nothing we can do to help ourselves. But by His grace, God saves us and brings us to heaven. And as the Scripture tells us, no one can boast in what they've done. Sadly, we have that taking place sometimes even in church. Folk will boast about what they have done. Look at my ministry. Look at what I have done. Well, you're, you've skewed things. It's pride then that has got in. And God will not have that in heaven. It's what he threw the devil out of heaven for. Pride. We all come to God on the same basis. He brings us. He saves us. He's the one who raises us. He's the one who seats us in the heavenly realms. And no one, therefore, can think any better of themselves than any other. It's all of grace, because it's by grace we've been saved. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 declares, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You are a new person. The old has gone. The new is here. And there was another song that we used to sing many years ago, a song by Dave Bilborough. Dave Bill was a well-known worship leader. His mother-in-law was in the Cornerstone Christian Fellowship in Aberdeen that we were part of, and he would come regularly to lead praise, and he produced a number of albums. These are the sort of things that were circular plastic for anyone under the age of 30, pre-CDs even. And I had, well, I think, Lynn, you had a, an album of Dave Bill Ross, An Army of Ordinary People, I seem to remember. And one of his songs was, I am a new creation, and I'm going to bless you with singing. <laughs> We're on a roll. I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God I stand. My heart is overflowing. My love just keeps on growing. Here in the grace of God I stand. And I will praise you, Lord. Yes, I will praise you, Lord. And I will sing of all that you have done. A joy that knows no limit. A likeness in my spirit. Here in the grace of God I stand. Great words, just tremendous words. And you, know, you will have your own choruses, songs, uh, psalms that mean much to you, and maybe they're from a, quite a number of years ago. And so as we come to a close, it is God's grace from first to last. Paul has already celebrated God's glorious grace in the previous chapter. In verse 6, he calls it that. In verses 7 and 8, he says, the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. And so in chapter 2, in verse 7, as we come to a close, we read that all God has done in making us alive together with Christ, in raising us up with him, in seating us with Jesus in heavenly places, the reason is 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That is such a tremendous hope for the future, because the reality is that for most of us in this auditorium, 20 to 30 years' time, we're not going to be here. But we have an age to look forward to, where God will show immeasurable grace, kindness to us. You know, heaven is a, such an amazing place for us. And we are already there positionally in Christ. Pastor Koken notes, God wants to spend eternity showering us with his blessings. And maybe our life has been to some extent bereft of kindness, bereft there's been little grace. We've had difficult situations, even family situations, or fathers, or grandfathers, or children who have gone astray, difficulties. We've had anxiety. We've had uh, pain. But in heaven, all that goes. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. There is no sin. But the immeasurable riches of God's grace and His kindness will be for us in eternity. So no matter whether we have got 20 years on this earth or 70 years or 100 years, it pales into insignificance compared to eternity because the ages to come, we will be there with God. We will be there with Jesus as a co-heir. You know, new resurrection body. Can't be bad. And so we need to look at things from that perspective and we need to encourage people to find, to tell them that there is a, a life to come, that it doesn't just end. And even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of Paul Martin's situation, tragic as it may be, and we're praying for a miracle, but eternity stretches far beyond our earthly life. So we don't get hung up, and we, but, uh, we do. We do get hung up on here and now. But what the, Paul is saying, remember, he's in a prison. He is, at the very least, in, under house arrest. And he is waxing lyrical about the coming ages that God is going to shower us, lavish His grace through all eternity, His kindness, His love, His mercy, His faithfulness, His compassion, everything that Jesus spoke about, the, the, the prodigal son in that parable, which really should be the parable of the gracious Father, because it reveals something of God as the one who reaches out, the one who goes out to meet the son who was lost, who was dead, but then was made alive. The purpose of God is to bring everything together under Christ for the benefit of the church. We've seen that at the end of chapter 1. And, but as Koken goes on, his plan for us is to forever pour out a torrent of kindness upon us in heaven and demonstrate forever in the spiritual dimension the wisdom of his grace as revealed in the cross. He concludes, and so every day we shall be flooded with fresh blessings of his grace to explore that will prompt us to praise our Savior. And the very last line I want to say, the 19th century Bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle, he wrote this, let us not be afraid to meditate often on the subject of heaven and to rejoice in the prospect of good things to come. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the revelation of the truth that is found in these few verses in Ephesians. We thank you that you are the one who makes us alive. Holy Spirit, I pray that for our families, I pray for our acquaintances, our friends, that, Lord, that you will awaken them to know you. Lord, that even as you have awakened us, that you will awaken them. Lord, that in your mercy, that you will bring them from death to life. 
that in your love that you will take them from darkness into the light of Christ, and that by your grace that you'll open their eyes, that you'll touch their hearts, and that through faith in Christ that we'll see men, women, and young people experience salvation for themselves. That many, and may each of us today, too, be reassured that through the Word and by the Spirit, that individually, that we have been raised with Christ, that we have been seated with Him in the heavenly realms, and that we will know that whatever is going on in our lives, that we are in that place, that we are in the best seat in the universe. And may we remind ourselves, may we speak the gospel to ourselves, may we speak the truth of God's word to ourselves, may we seek to subdue the flesh, may we rebuke the worldly uh, uh, things that are said, even by those who are well-meaning in our families or friends, and may we rebuke the devil's lies. God, grant us a heavenly perspective, and grant us uh, the, 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 just the grace to be channels of grace and mercy to those that we come in contact with. May we know your love flowing through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's just wonderful words to meditate on and contemplate. And so as we come to a close, let's uh, just praise God. Thank Him for the cross. Thank Him for the blood that was shed. Thank Him for His mercy to you, to me, and to each one. And that those that we know who are in our families who have still to commit to the Lord Jesus Christ, that He will make them alive. Amen. stand before you is by my regrets and the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself that I am not a man condemned but Jesus Christ is my defense let's sing that again when I stand accused by my regrets And the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself That I am not a man condemned But Jesus Christ is my defense My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When my doubt shame hang over me like the arrows of the enemy I will run again to Calvary that rugged hill of hell's defeat my fortress and my victory my sin is near cross. My soul is healed by the skies. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the skies. Now I'm alive.
worship him with holy hands and raise the song that never ends of Jesus Christ, my righteousness. Let's sing that again. When I stand before the throne at last, his blood will plead my innocence. I will worship him with holy hands and raise the song that never ends of Jesus Christ, my righteousness. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank we thank you, you for the victory that was won there. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the ongoing advance of your kingdom. And we pray, Father, that that will continue uh, in the days ahead. And Lord God, just that we will see your salvation working out in the lives of men and women and young people. And today, Lord, we pray that you'd strengthen us in our spirit, that you would reveal your truth to us, and that we would go from this place reassured that you are for us, you're not against us, that your grace has made us alive in Jesus Christ, and your mercy uh, is new every morning for us, that you're a faithful God, that your love endures forever, and that each and every one of us is valuable in your sight, valued in Jesus Christ, and that we have been united with him. And that is such a place of security, a place of, uh, uh, of wonderful identity, and it enables us to deal with the enemy's strategies and the worldly schemes and the fleshly behavior that sometimes comes our way. So God, would you fill us with your grace? Would you fill us with your mercy? Would you fill us with your love and power? Lord God, from heaven above, that we might be witnesses to you and to your kingdom purposes here on earth, to those that we're in contact with, to the glory of your name and to the furthering of your kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, one thing I did forget to mention was today is not only Father's Day, but it is the Giving Day, Timothy Fund Day. And uh, um, as we have put out information about that, um, I'm not going to go on about it, but uh, today everything that is given to the box or online will go towards the Timothy Fund, looking at the ministry of the church and expanding the influence, particularly with children and young people but looking at other aspects of the, the church life in the future. So uh, all this week, anything that is given can be given up until Saturday or so, and then next Sunday we'll announce the grand total, hopefully more than 2 and 6 or 50p. But uh, we pray that uh, yeah, God will stir our hearts. This is the th thing. God, if God stirs your heart to give, then give. Praise God. Amen. Thank you for coming. And